kiddos you guys can head out for Kids Connect. Everyone else, if you would turn with me to John 15. John 15. <laughs> well, if you've got kind of like an indent in your Bible, it just falls open there at this point. John 15, we're going to be starting in verse 18. Starting in verse 18. We started this last week, and we'll see if it goes. We actually do the sermon. God, I think, had us in a very important place last week. That was just, I don't know if it was a blessing to you, but it was a blessing to me to really be able to lean in on this connection between abiding in Christ and the need to abide with one another. The connection between abiding with Christ and the need to abide with one another, and that's our theme, is to abide. It's to abide in this relationship with Jesus. So as Jesus is, I want to remind you of context, Jesus is literally walking towards the garden in John 15. Walking towards the garden where he will be arrested, walking in a real sense towards his own death on the cross, and he is preparing his disciples for his departure, this farewell address. He's preparing them to continue his mission. But in John 15, Jesus calls them to abide with him. To abide in him as he abides in them. To abide in his love and to let his word abide in them. To abide with one another over and over again. He's calling them into this personal, daily, deepening relationship with him. And it's only then, it's only then that we can fulfill our mission. It's only when we keep living with him in a relationship with him at the center of everything we do that we can have this fullness of joy so not only for the sake of our mission but for the sake of our joy in him i think this is so crucial folks as we're thinking about how difficult and how much how difficult it is to reach the world around us as we we're very honest around here about the obstacles to our mission to make disciples to bear fruit that lasts but if we get caught up in what can I do, what do I need to do, all these outward things, all these works I can do, but we're not actually connected to the vine, the source of life. If we're not actually living in a relationship with Jesus, none of that matters. None of that matters. You're going to strive, you're going to strive, you're going to strive, and you're going to miss the fact that the Lord of all wants to have a relationship with you. In fact, we saw... In the passage before the one we're looking at, he wants to have a friendship with you. That he wants you to abide in a friendship with him. So that obeying and doing this mission isn't your job. That you coming and worshiping in God's house, right, in this just place that God's given us. You coming and doing this isn't your job to think, well, I, it's what we do. You know, it's just the thing you do. That's a, God not interested in you. Just this bitter obligation, this going through the motion, this stale relationship where you check all the boxes. Because it's not about a job, it's about your joy. It's about your joy. And then we're supposed to stir that up in one another because he says, not once, but twice in that passage before, to love one another. Love one another. If you'll understand my love for you, abide in my love. If you'll understand my friendship with you, this isn't about a job, this is about your joy, then you will love one another. And that leads us to where we are. John 15. We're going to read 18 through 21. There's a little passage in between there that kind of dives into something kind of separate um, that we're not going to look at today. But then we're going to pick up when it really brings in a new element in verse 26, it's very important we've actually sung about this morning. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word, the message that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So let's put that in the context that we've read, we've seen the Bible for. Since they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
If, since they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him, the Father, who sent me. And here's a beautiful, in the midst of all that, which can seem really dark, he reminds us of something so crucial, verse 26. But when the helper, the paraclete, not parakeet, that's important, the helper comes, the advocate, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the word of God to us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just want to take one more moment to pray before we dive into your word, because we do not want to do this lightly. You have made yourself known in a form that we can discern, that we can strive to understand. And even though there are things in here that are tough, that take a lifetime and even more to understand because they're just, to be honest with you, so much of you is knowable, so much of you is approachable. And we know that because you want to have a relationship with us and you have spoken to us. So I pray, Lord, this morning we would hear. You have shown yourself to us this morning. I pray this morning that we would see. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, would the Spirit give me words to say, because nothing that is going to come out of this time to strengthen us, to encourage us, to challenge and convict us, is going to be of me. It's got to be of you, Father, working by your Spirit in our lives. And it's in your Son's name that all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So, when you're a young Christian, I don't know about some of you. I the, the Lord found me in my mess when I was five years old, um, and I didn't get baptized till I was six. But I've been trying to walk with the Lord for for so much of my life. And here's the funny thing: being a Christian in elementary school is is an experience, um, especially when you decide to take serious this whole missions thing and tell people the gospel. Uh, but maybe you you miss out on the important parts. You just get the really loud, aggressive parts. So you can imagine, I'm probably not too hard. Like a second grade Jared just yelling, you're going to hell, you need Jesus. <laughs> First of all, son, go sit in your seat. <laughs> right? um, or you, know, you just, you come across really hard, you're playing PE and they do something to me. It's like, see, you're a sinner like me, you need Jesus. They're like, okay, <laughs> right? So I have one of those stories I just deeply remember. Um, I also have positive, like, God worked in some really cool ways. I got to lead, when I was in fifth grade, I got to lead a fellow fifth grader to Christ. Um, wasn't going to church anywhere. And it, was one of the, it was one of those things that, man, God is so good. So a lot of cool things. Let me give you those positives. Don't give up on elementary school Christians. God uses them in profound ways. And they're working through a lot of stuff as they're doing that, right? They're maturing in every way, not to mention just spiritual growth. But there was one of those growing moments I had to walk through. Her name was Sierra, and she just knew how to push my buttons. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I'm in Miss Belt art class. She's awesome. I don't know what we're doing, but I know she's talking and I'm talking. It's not going well, right? I'm, I'm trying to talk to her about church. Like, what, where, you know, the classic line, they get like, so where do you go to church? Where do you go? And her response, without hesitation, I vividly remember is, the church is filled with a bunch of corrupt people, and your dad's just there to make money. I don't think she said corrupt. That's a little big for second grade. But something like that. Like, the church is just terrible. They're just there to make money. And your pastor's just there to get rich. And I'm like, first of all, my pastor is a pig farmer, okay? Monty Schinkel is, is not in anything. From, like, he never accepted that in life. Um, but I had to get really, de- I got really defensive, right? You're picking on the pastor. You're picking on church. And so I'm like, we're not even about the gospel anymore. I'm just like, oh, dang. And there's fisticuffs in there. I'm not, I'm, it's verbal fisticuffs. But um, I'm, she, was, she was larger. I wasn't going after that. I didn't want to risk losing that one. So, but I was, I remember being so mad and she was so mad at me. And here's the thing that I learned it. I learned it. (laughs) (laughs) That was in the notes. Uh, I type better than I speak sometimes. This is what I learned. I'm not having a stroke, folks, I promise. Um, As a Christian, you're going to be hated. And sometimes it's because 
you're a mean person, right? But not always. So in a moment like that, I realized like I'm hated and it was very easy for me to be like, oh yeah, for the name of Jesus, ooh, pump the brakes, little Jared, right? Maybe you're hearing like, I'm hated, pump the brakes for a second. Why are you hated? Why are you hated? For whose sake are you hated? If you feel like you're hated. What we see in this passage is that you will experience hate. You will experience rejection. This is what we see in this passage. And I remember that story because it was my first time where I experienced that. But I went on to realize that I'm going to be rejected by people because I stand up for Jesus. Because I want to live his way, not my own. He makes that a promise, actually. When we look at this, we see, even in this totally wrong way that I, I did it, and I responded in the absolute worst way, but at the heart of it, there's this reality. I'm going to be rejected. Because as you abide with Jesus, prepare to be rejected with Jesus. Prepare to be rejected. I, I, I gave a negative example just because it's hilarious. But also, there's more positive where there are, there are friendships that I just lost. The people just weren't interested in being friends with me because they knew oh, there's a certain kind of life I wanted to live. On the plus side, there were people who would talk to me because they know I'm one of those Jesus people. He's like one of those like really, he's like one of those church going Christians. Have you ever heard that before? One of those church going Christians. I'm like I think that's the only kind, right? Um, but you experience that sort of rejection. And persecution, and the good news we have here is we realize that being friends of Jesus is going to make you an enemy of the world. You have to begin to realize that the love of my church family was meant to stand in contrast to the hatred of an unbelieving world. And we need to be prepared for that. If you abide with Jesus, going and bearing fruit for him, going and making disciples. With him, you will be hated with Jesus, persecuted with Jesus, rejected with Jesus, and we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared because about 360 million Christians around the world live in active persecution. 360 million Christians. Active, daily, daily. It is the air that they breathe on a regular basis. Over 360 million disciples of Jesus are utterly, systematically, even violently rejected in their countries. And from among those last year, about 6,000, that's a low end number, 6,000 were rejected for Jesus at the cost of their life. Averages about, if I remember correctly, I didn't put it in my notes, about 16 every day last year died for the name of Jesus. This isn't an ancient problem. It's just one that we get very isolated from. But I think if we've been paying attention to what's happening in the culture around us, that's where we're headed. And the question we need to ask is are we prepared? Well, Jesus wants to prepare us. I just want us to look at two things. Two things. First, he's trying to prepare us. Prepare to be rejected like Jesus. Prepare to be rejected like Jesus. It's beautiful. In, in the New Testament, as we look at these letters over and over again, it talks about how not only are you called to believe in him, to love like him, to walk like him, to experience joy like him, you're going to do that as you're going to suffer like him. And maybe some of you, even in this room, were bought to a form of Christianity that is absolutely bankrupt of biblical truth because it taught you that if you follow Jesus, everything gets easier. None of your, all your problems go away. But the reality is used in different ways. But what do we use over and over again? Bible study, disciples. What do we do? We use context, context, context. And over and over again, especially in John, this isn't just talking about a geographical space, like the earth floating around in the universe. Instead, it's talking about the people, the powers, the systems 
the re in creation that reject the creator. Right? So it's the people, power, systems, anything in creation that rejects the creator. Oftentimes, as you read this, you begin to get the sense that it's the rejecting culture of the times. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whatever the flavor might be in your specific decade or century, the world is those out there that reject Jesus. They reject God, they reject their creator. And this word hated, hatred, um, hates, all those, we, we talked about this last week, sometimes we go straight to the emotional of like being really like mad at someone. But really at, at the core of hatred is rejection. It's rejection. If we think of hatred in the context of a relationship, it is to reject someone. If we go inward, if we go inward, you'll remember from last week we talked about how that's a desire to harm someone. So it's a rejection, but then it's amped up. It's this desire to harm someone. So being apathetic to someone isn't hatred. You want to acknowledge that. Just if you don't care about someone. Now we realize that some, I, I, this is a separate sermon, so I can't chase this, but I just want to throw this out there. At some point, apathy becomes passive hatred. Because you're unwilling to do the thing. What you're doing, passively, just kind of hanging out, is harming someone else. Even if you don't see it, even if you're not willing to acknowledge it. So I will say, apathy can turn into hatred. But let's know what hatred is. It's this desire to harm someone. Not a desire, not necessarily an unwill, uh, anything that would hurt someone's feelings. Because sometimes love is going to require you to hurt someone's feelings a little bit. Maybe a whole lot. I know that's not popular to say in a, in a culture that says if you love someone, you just accept whatever they say is true. And you love them where they're at. But the reality is you love them. To love someone is to desire God's good for them. To love someone is to accept someone, even if you don't accept everything they believe. Even if you don't accept their sin as being good just because they think it's good. Again, a whole sermon we can go into right there. Let's understand what's coming towards us is a rejection. He's saying you will be rejected. Why? Because they rejected me. They rejected me. They rejected me before they ever rejected you. But this isn't just passive. This is actually incredibly active. Look at verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours. So that, that last bit right there, if they keep my words, that's talking about if they, they believe them, they obey them. So it is, it's, it, there's this positive, in the midst of all this hatred, it's saying, hey, there's still, just as there were those that believed me, there will be those that believe you. Even if you're like, no, everybody hates me, the world is against me, we can't go out there and share the gospel, they all hate us. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. They hated me way before they hated you. And I call people to follow me, and they follow. I shared with them the good news of the kingdom, and they became inhabitants of the kingdom. I told people about new life in me, and they were born again. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. But if they will keep my words, there was someone out there. There are people out there that I have prepared for you who I'm working in them. And you just need to go and bear fruit. Really good encouragement in the midst of all that. But they persecuted Jesus, right? Before John 15 and the bulk of his ministry, the world persecuted him with slander and defamation and incredible cruelty. But as Jesus is walking with his disciples here in John 15, we know he's walking to a garden where the depths of his persecution will, re will begin. He will experience utter and violent rejection of those he came to save. Even the people who received him, loved him, accepted him as the Christ, the Messiah, with shouts of hallelujah, will then reject him as a criminal with cries of crucify him. And he will be persecuted to the point of death, even death on a cross. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you, which I contended earlier. You can read that as since, on the condition that they persecuted me, on the reality that they've already persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Which I want you to hear every time you hear this, to not just assume that someone's actively persecuting you. In fact, maybe in the back of your mind, you should be thinking, 
Why do I not experience people persecuting me? Let that be something that sticks in the back of your head as we keep going. Let it, let it, I mean, this is an aggressive word, but I like to say, let it haunt you a little bit. If Jesus said this, if he was persecuted, if he said, if you walk with me, you're going to suffer with me. If you're going to abide with me, you're going to be rejected with me. Why am I not experiencing that? I want that to just be in the back of your mind over and over again. Not because I want you to live in guilt and shame, but because I want you to be ready for the Spirit to show you something that might not be comfortable, but will be beautiful and glorious and change your life and those around you forever. So have that in the back of your head. Jesus describes the depth of this, per the depth of this persecution in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 10. Look at, you can look up on the screen with me. Matthew. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, there we go. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Oh, we can't even get into that. So good. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them the Gentiles. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his children. And children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Are you ready for that? Jesus is calling right now. Can you hear me? <laughs> if you abide with Christ, stand with him, love like him, we will face brutal, often unthinkable, thinkable, and imaginable suffering. We will suffer socially. We will suffer relationally, we will suffer emotionally, we will suffer, suffer physically, even to the point of death. We will be hated. Sometimes this hate will be obvious. It will be obvious and cleared and loud and we'll make it into the new cycle. But most of the time, this hatred will be subtle and deceptive. Disguised as open-mindedness, and tolerance, lashing out in self-righteousness. But if you go and bear fruit in the love of Jesus, you will be hated. Jesus does, not want, Jesus does not want you and me to be surprised. He wants us to be prepared. He wants us to understand that this is part of God's plan for restoring all things, for redeeming sinners like you and me, and for loving the world. When hatred comes, he doesn't want you to think, God has forgotten me. Instead, God has remembered you. God is preparing you. But it's just like we talk about around here, when we talk about policies in, in your jobs, I'm sure, when we talk about policies, you don't wait till your house is on fire to figure out the safety route. We need to be prepared. He wants you to realize before you get in that fire, be prepared. And then when you are, don't be surprised. Peter, I love First Peter. Y'all know me. I love 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He's like, he's like, you're like, what is happening? Why did everyone hate me? He's like, why are you surprised? This is not a strange thing. Jesus told you this was going to happen. He's been preparing you for this to happen. Don't be surprised, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you suffer with him, that you may re also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God will rest upon you. But let none of you, like Jared in second grade, suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. I'm going to throw in a harsh word because there's no kids in the room. Being a jerk. Did I just say that? Just because you have strong opinions about man. Oh, Lord, you're scheduled. Right? But you, it doesn't matter what you believe. If you're being a jerk, you're wrong. But Jared, I'm saying the gospel. I'm saying the gospel truth. But you're being a jerk. You're being rude. You're talking over people. You're not listening to people. 
people. What does that do for the name of Jesus? Because all they're hearing is Jesus, 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 jerk, jerk, jerk. So they're not getting to see Jesus, they're seeing you. They're not getting to hear his love, they're hearing you. I just, we need to understand that. We have to stand strong. But if you're imagining this as if you going out and yelling at someone because they disagree with you, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. To love like him. And yes, sometimes you're going to have to get real about it because we know Jesus does. But Peter actually earlier in 1 Peter said, if you're going to give a defense for the reason that, of the hope that is in you, do it with gentleness and respect. No matter what side of the aisle they are, no matter how they voted, no matter where they come from or what kind of language they use with you, with gentleness and respect. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. We shouldn't be surprised, family. We should not be surprised. We should be prepared to be rejected. But sharing his love, bearing his fruit, going with his gospel is worth it. Experiencing a relationship with him more fully, more deeply as we enter into suffering with him, not avoiding suffering, as if God's only going to bless you and work in you in the pretty shiny places. No, he invites you into the wilderness like Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And that's where he kicks Satan's tiny. If you just stayed in Jerusalem, you had hung out at weddings where it was really comfortable, you got to dance, you got to have fun. You would have missed out on that. We would have missed out on that. But he says, no, no, I'm going to take you into the wilderness. I'm going to take you out of, go all the way back to the Old Testament. Let's hear from Moses and the people of Israel. He's going to have to take you out of bondage, but he doesn't just put you straight in the promised land because you've got some work that needs done. So he takes you to the wilderness and he gives you manna and he blesses you in all these ways and you're going to be stiff-necked, rebellious, and broken and he's going to keep loving you. But if you think I'm going to experience a relationship with him, I'm going to abide with him as long as I avoid all these negative things. I don't want to go out there and have my feelings hurt. I don't want to have to open up to anyone in a church family and have them actually say that I need to change something. I want to go out there and someone be able to ask me a question and maybe I can't give an answer. Maybe I look dumb. Maybe I feel uncomfortable. And because you have this rose-tinted view of Christ that is not biblical, you think that Jesus only wants you in those pleasant places, but he says, no, I have a pleasant place for you, but now I'm going to lead you into the valley because I'm the God of the valley and I'm the God of the hilltops. I looked into the heavens and you were there. I looked down into the abyss and you were there. He's walking with you. Hallelujah. All right. He is worth it. Real quick, looking back at our passage. So much good, God's good. All right, looking back at our passage, Jesus is preparing us for why we will be rejected and hated. Let's rattle these off with a little bit of briskness. But just verse 19, starting there, we were hated for belonging to Jesus. We're hated for belonging to Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would, would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world wants you to fit in. Family, look at me. The world wants you to fit in. It craves for you to look just like them, for your bank account to look just like theirs, for your schedule and your busyness to look just like theirs, because our enemy knows that if he can get you to look just like the world, your priorities to look just like the world, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, like just get you into the uniform of the world. He's got you. Because you're not focused on abiding in Christ, you're focused on abiding in this world. Making sure you're not resting in the acceptance of Jesus, you're fighting and grasping for the affection of the world that will never be given to you, that will never be enough. It wants you to just fit in, to toe the line. To be so filled with the things of this world, you can't even think straight. And folks, I'm guilty of it too, right? I'm preaching to me just as much to you. I haven't gotten this all figured out. I'm working on it, and I can make it look real pretty because I'm a pastor, so it's the truth, so it can't be that bad. No, because if I try to make being a pastor of God's people look like being a CEO of a company in the world of people who 
don't care, people are giving their life over because it's not, it's still broken. It wants you to go with the flow. And ironically, even when you try to stand out, even when the world has says people waving their free flag saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm weird, I'm strange, I'm crazy, you're not, no one's like me, I'm my own person. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not condemning that. The problem is, is that if you live for that, you're going to be so dissatisfied. If it's all about, I need to be my own person, I need to show the world just how special and unique, the most devastating thing, folks, family, hear this, is the more you do that, the more you're just like everybody else. Living for yourself, following after the world, following after the prince of the power of the air, a child of disobedience. Second Ephesians 1 and 2. When you abide with Jesus, if you keep him at the center of your life, you are fitting in, you're standing out because you belong to him. And it doesn't fit in. And they're not going to like it. They're going to feel um, uncomfortable. They're going to accuse you of trying to shame them or make them feel guilty. They're going to accuse you of not caring enough, of not working hard enough, because you actually want to have a balanced life with Christ at the center of your life, not there, not them, not your job, not these other things. They're going to reject you for that. We could dig into all the different, but if you belong to Jesus, it's worth it. It's worth it. Two, we're hated for being sent by Jesus. For being sent by Jesus. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Pause, remember that he said, abide in this friendship with me, you're friends of me. But notice, it doesn't mean he stops being our Lord. It just means we get to be friends with the Lord of the universe. That's kind of amazing. Amen? That's why we, like, let's, we can worship on that alone. Just meditating on that truth. Servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me. Since they persecuted me, they will persecute you. We are not saved to casually hold some truths, to hold some beliefs that no one needs to hear about. Are you hearing me, Christian? We were not saved to love people with whatever truth is convenient and comfortable for us and for them. We were saved to share the gospel, the core of our beliefs, to love people with the truth that brings life, with Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. If you are saved this morning, then you are sent. The only question is, are you going? If you are saved, then you are sent. If you are saved, then you are sent. The hard news, the world doesn't like that. Hard reality, the world doesn't like that. The world hates that Jesus would send you to save them. Because that means that they need saving. And they don't think they need saving. They don't think they need your truth. They have their truth. They have their beliefs. They, they don't want you challenging. They want you accepting, celebrating their truth. And so... They don't like that you're being sent. They want a version of Jesus that says, hey, everybody love everybody. If you want the, you know, if you want the cone with the flavor of Jesus, go for it. If you want a cone with the flavor of secular humanism, go for it. If you want a flavor of Buddhism or this, you, know, you name it, that's fine. That's the Jesus they want. Who just says, love everybody. Love everybody. Yeah, but what is love in that context? A thing that doesn't care about what is good, doesn't care about what is good. Again, another sermon. As Jesus said, some will keep our words just as they kept his. But we will be hated. We will be hated. All because we have been sent by Jesus and we won't just shut up and mind our own business and stop caring about what others believe. Stop caring about the wages of sin and the reality of hell. Stop caring about the true life that is only found in Jesus Christ, the true life. Because you are sent to not stay silent, you will be hated. But if you remember the thing that should be haunting us, if you're not experiencing that kind of rejection, are you actually going? If Jesus already promised that you're going to say things that offend people, but you're never offending people, Maybe it's because you're never actually telling them the things they need to hear. 
with gentleness and respect. That should bother us. I'm not saying you're looking to pick a fight. I'm saying are you living sense because you are saved. We're hated. We'll make this the last thing and then we'll, we'll end. I know we've got some more here, but God's given that one. We're hated by those who hate Jesus and the Father. Okay. I think this one is so helpful. Y'all out there, this I God kind of showed me this as I was studying and it got me all giddy. It was it's just so helpful to remember. John 15, 21, that last verse there, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. He's talking about the Father. In fact, we see that in verse 23. Whoever hates me hates my father also. Whoever hates me hates my father also. Which is also when you get someone who says, no, 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 let's, let's blend all religions together. We all have one God, right? Jews and Muslims. Let's just blend it all together. But if they hate Jesus, if they reject him as not just some mere prophet, not some, some mere nice guy, but as the Lord of Lords and King, if they reject him, they've rejected the Father. I don't care if they call it the Church of Latter-day Saints. If they reject Jesus as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings in eternal equality with God, they've rejected the Father. That is reality. It's, if, don't be offended by me. It's what the word says. It's what he said. If you reject the Father, you hate the Father. You, if you hate me, you hate the Father also. But what, how is that encouragement? Jeremy, where's the encouragement? This hatred is bigger than just us. It's not really even about us. It's about the world rebelling against God, against the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But that can give us clarity when people hate us. We don't have to take it personally. When they hate me because I'm talking about Jesus, it's really easy for, especially, can I say your pastor? Because I, I want to please people, I want people to be happy, but I have to put that kind of selfishness on the cross and let it be crucified because you already died for it. But the reality is if I can go into those circumstances and I'm like, ooh, they're going to be offended, mm, they're going to be bothered, mm, they're not going to like that, I can step back and be like, wait, they don't hate me. They hate the one who sent me. They don't hate me. Me, I'm just the son. They hate my father. You're just a dog. He hates, they hate the father. It's not even about me. They think it's probably think it's about me. But I know better. So I can step back and be like, mm, I don't have to wear that. And here's the good thing. Can I just say, your heavenly Abba, he's got big shoulders. He can take the hatred. He can take the rejection. And I'm praising God because my father, the haters will answer for it. I don't have to take care of that. You don't have to take care of that. You don't need to put them in their place and win an argument. He said, really not arguing with you. They're arguing with the father who wants to make them sons and daughters. But instead of being children of God, they're children of wrath. So it doesn't have to be on me. I just have to go and bear fruit and cast seeds and let God be the God of growth instead of me. I don't have to take it personally. I can take all that weight I want to put on my shoulders of people not liking me, especially in a small town like this where everybody knows everybody and everybody calls you friend, and what if they don't anymore? It's like, see, I've got Jesus, and I've got his family. I've got everything I need. Kind of like we talked about last week. They can reject me. That's fine. I know you love me. And even get, get this, even when you have weeks, days, months where you struggle to love me well, or I struggle to love you well, I don't give up on you because he hasn't given up on me. And he still loves me. He still loves you. And he's never failed you. Y'all feeling an amen up in there? Yeah. Right? We do want to come back next week and we got to hear about the spirit because that just blows this thing wide open. But if you would just bow your heads with me. The sermon's over. This is a time of response. We've sat around the table of God's word. We've feasted.